happy Sabbath to everybody this morning. Uh, we have so many blessings, don't we? Every single day. The song we're singing this morning uh, has some things in it. Sort of has been in tune with what's been going on today. About we do have troubles, we have storms in our life, and everything. But we do know that we have the strength in the Lord, and that's the most important thing. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand, let me see by the light thou hast shown. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light, take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home when the way seems dark and long. As I pass amid the throng, hold to my hand. Hold to my hand, dear Lord, I pray. Surely grace to shout and shine ever in the light divine. Lord, lead me on from day to day. Lord, lead me on. From day to From day, day to day, I want to, I walk, want to walk the brand new the way. way. The friends no more saints forsake me all alone. alone. I ask the Lord to lead me. The light turned green, John. I can talk. Steve and Sharon, thank you so much. Amen. It has been a privilege of ours, Audrey's and mine, to live next door or close to next door to Steve and Sharon. 
And for those of you that don't know, they have a CD out that is really inspiring. And if you would get busy, Sharon, you could write some more songs for us. <laughs> Thank you again. Our scripture reading in John, and by the way, we thank you for the scripture reading. It says that we're going to have troubles. Anybody here relate to that? You mean everything hasn't been a smooth highway? A few years back, Audrey and I had the privilege of being in California. And driving down one of the interstates, we came to a sign that was kind of disturbing. It says detour. And we were on an overhead highway. Why would they detour you off of that? Well, it seems that one of the signs of the soon coming of our Lord had transpired in California and they'd had an earthquake. And it had wiped out the highway up there just ahead of us. It was a good thing there was a sign there. On the day of the earthquake, some people were not so fortunate. And we've come a long way since then in time. And I would take you on a mind journey this morning to the Ukraine. Where war is going on right now. And this scene is transpiring a thousand times larger than what I'm describing. I'm going to describe three ladies walking along a road, going out of a country to head for another one. And today there are thousands of people doing exactly that. These three women were widows, all three of them. And they had just started their journey. Ten years before this, the mother and the two boys and the father had a moving caravan that moved them into this country. Now they were leaving just three ladies walking. Father had died. Two sons had married in the interim and their wives were now going with the mother out of town. No moving van. They were not riding on camels. They were walking. Now some of you are really physical fit. <coughs> Physically fit, excuse me. Some of us, not so much. How many of you would like to start walking this afternoon from Lebanon to Republic? No volunteers? These ladies felt that they had no choice. For when this story took place, and by the way, you all already alluded to it or know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Ruth and her two daughter-in-laws. Anybody ever heard a story about mother-in-laws? I, I hear some chuckles. Most of them are humorous or downgrading. But this one is an example that I hope you all remember. The father dies, the two sons die, and in that in that time women had absolutely no status. If you had sheep or cattle, even dogs had a higher status than the women. 
They had no status at all as far as human beings. And a few minutes or a few hours into the walk, the mother-in-law stops. And she turns to her two daughter-in-laws. And she says, girls, you need to go home. You need to go back to the families that raised you. You need to go back where there's possibility for you to expand your life. And the one girl says, looks at her mother-in-law and tears streaming down her face. She said, I really would like to go with you. But your words are words of wisdom. And so she kisses Naomi on the cheek and walks away. When I was in the fifth grade of our church school, we had a memory verse to learn. And for some reason, it really was hard for me to get around it and commit it to memory. It was the words of Ruth. As she knelt there on that road and begged her mother-in-law, with these words, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Whether you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. And this was the end of her plea. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death part you and me. Scripture goes on and says that Naomi, when she saw that Ruth was determined to follow her, and I thought these words were kind of funny. She talked to her no more. They turned and started walking. The journey from Moab to Bethlehem was about 60 miles. And I haven't clocked it, but I think from here to Republic is awfully close. Picture this through desert through hot climate we don't even know that they had enough food besides what they could gather along the way they had no money but they were going back to the homeland where Elimelech had come from And that was Naomi's husband who had passed away. It says in the Bible, and you can follow along in the book of Ruth if you would like to, that when they got to Bethlehem, the whole town made to do over Naomi's return. They had been well thought of people. They had been wealthy people in that land and only a drought and a famine had made them move in the first place. Now we don't know that Naomi ever had the opportunity to preach a sermon. But I'm here to tell you that the sermon she lived, the sermon she lived before her two daughter-in-laws brought them salvation. 
You've got to remember, folks, that the Israelites thought the Moabites were worse than the woman at the well who said that even the dogs get to eat the crumbs from the table. It will be a privilege for you and I when and if we get to heaven to meet Ruth. You know, she and Sarah are two people, two women that I would dearly like to meet. Sarah had been a whale of a woman. For Abraham to fear for losing her at the age of 75 or 80. And then again, 10 years later. Ruth was that same kind of woman. After they had been in Bethlehem a few time, a few days or weeks, we don't know how long, it was the barley harvest. Any of you ever planted barley? Any of you ever planted wheat? That came just a few weeks later. They had no money. They didn't drive down the streets of town and look at the signs like we do in Lebanon today where it says, we're hiring. There's jobs everywhere. There's only one reason for a person to be unemployed today. Well, maybe two or three. But the main one is that you don't want to work. You know, it may not be the job of your choice. But there's work there. Naomi and Ruth talked. One of Naomi's, one of Elimelech's brothers was Boaz, or his closest relative. And Naomi says, go ahead and go and see if you can get us some food by gleaning. What do you picture when you mean, when you say gleaning? I remember in about the sixth grade, two of the kids in the eighth grade wanted to go pick potatoes behind a potato digger. So yours truly says, I'm big enough, I can go too. And for three weeks, we were excused from school on what today would be a work permit. And we went out in the field and picked potatoes. You ever thought how many potatoes are in a bushel? Whew, that's what you got paid by. You picked in a metal basket, and you left it in a row, and you put a tag on it. And in the evening, the boss or the foreman would go down the rows, and pick up just the, just the little tag that you put in the basket. And that's how you got paid. And I mean, we were overpaid. We were rich. I think we got a couple, three dollars maybe, for a day's work. Dirty, dusty. I wasn't sure that I liked potatoes after I did that job. <laughs> But we got over that. Ruth goes out and picks up stalks of grain. Stalk of wheat. And she gathered it up. And at the end of the day, the Bible tells you how much weight she had picked. And how much barley she gleaned from it. And she took it to town. And I'm guessing, it doesn't say, but she sold part of it and took part of it home for food. We don't know how old Boaz was, but he was a lot older than Ruth. 
But when Ruth got home, Naomi says, where did you go? Went to the field of Boaz, your relative. And she said, he came out and he offered to let me eat with the reapers. Can you see Naomi's mind going click, 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 and the arrow and the bow and arrow and, and shooting through a heart? She says, don't you go anywhere else. Don't go to anyone else's field. Stay there. And the next day she went back. And Boaz says, hmm, that cute little girl's back again. And this time she says, he says to his servants that are working the field, leave her extra grain. Don't be quite so clean in your picking up the, the harvest. And at the end of the day, she had twice as much. Now, I'm not sure how much cupidity Naomi really instigated, but it was plenty. For she told her, tonight, after the harvest is over, and they have the celebration, Boaz will probably sleep at the thrashing floor. And when he lays down to sleep, go uncover his feet, well, that one really got me. And lay down at his feet. And she did. And she went to sleep. And it says that Boaz woke up in the middle of the night. And can you picture this? He looks down at his feet. And here's a woman laying down there at his feet. Who are you? And she tells him. And his response to her was moved by the Holy Spirit. Not by lust. She slept the rest of the night there at his feet. But in the morning, he says, I will take care of you. I will take care of Naomi. And you have nothing to worry about. And it was a custom back then in that day that the nearest relative would marry that person so that the name of her husband who had died would be carried on and the lineage would not be cut off. They were married. And that young lady was the great grandmother of David. And the lineage of your Savior and mine, Jesus Christ. All because of a sermon that was preached without words but was in the form of a life of that mother-in-law. All throughout the Bible, there are stories of God's grace and His planning and His faithfulness. Ruth was faithful to her mother-in-law. Faithful to the pledge that she made there in the book of Ruth. We studied a little bit in our lesson study about Noah. He made a mistake. If there's anybody here that 
has not made a mistake, hang on to the pew because otherwise you're going to go through the ceiling. You'll be just like Elijah on his, on his way to heaven. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And through the grace of the Son of Man hanging on the cross and saying, Father, I've completed the work that you've given me. The plan of salvation is established through now and eternity. And all those who come to me in faith, and in faithfulness will have right to the tree of life because I bled and died for them. Sheldon mentioned something in the lesson study about not being perfect. And he's right. But the greatest fear, we're told by the servant of the Lord, as we see Christ descending from the clouds of heaven and standing there waiting to meet him, we have one fear. And that fear is this, brothers and sisters, that there's one sin that we have not asked forgiveness for to be placed under the blood of, blood of Christ. Each one of you. Think about the sermon that you're creating with your life. Think about the people that you meet from day to day. And we live in a busy, busy world. Many times we use the excuse we're too busy to really speak a word for Christ. I don't believe that we're that busy, but being so, or it's not too busy to live a life that shows Christ shining through us. Amen. That's all we are. You know what you're doing when you're on your knees praying or when you're reading your Bible? You're using a rag with polish on it. Polishing up your life so that the reflection of Jesus Christ shines through. May we rub the polish harder every day. For we're about to see the King of Kings return. He's coming for you. All you have to be is ready to receive him. And it's my prayer that like the mission story, we'll see each other on the other side. Isn't that what it's all about? Our closing song is, and I've dropped my bulletin. Somebody tell me what it is. 508. 508.